Welcome to the Wellness Revolution Podcast, the radio show all about wellness in your mind, body, spirit, personal growth, sex, and relationships. Stay tuned for weekly interviews featuring guests that have achieved physical, mental, and spiritual health in their lives. If you'd like to have access to our entire back catalog, visit drveronica.com for instant access. And here is your host, Dr. Veronica. Another episode of Dr. Veronica's Wellness Revolution. Thank you for joining us once again. I have with me, you're looking at the beautiful face of Dr. Lori Shemek, and she is the author of Fat Flammation. Fat Flammation, and you're saying, what is that complicated word that's a mouthful, and I have to be careful when I'm saying it, but you want to know about this. You want to get this book, Fat Flammation. What is it? Your fat and your inflammation are connected, and we're going to talk about it today. So what gives Dr. Lori Shemek the right to talk about it? Well, she's a researcher and has a background in psychology, and she understands all this. In addition, has been on CNN, is one of Dr. Oz's favorite, been featured in Woman's Day and Red Book. She's been all over the place. You might see her just as much as you see me all over the place, but I, you know I get the good people to bring to you to help you transform your life. So welcome to the Wellness Revolution, Dr. Lori Shemek. Well, thank you. Thank Tell you for us. having me. I'm great. It's great to be here. I've been looking forward to it. Yay. I know because you emailed my assistant and said, do I have the time right? Is it happening? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It is. And I was like, oh no, it's the wrong day. <laughs> yes. Because uh, you know we all have crazy schedules. Right. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about this fat inflammation thing. But before we do that, let's get into your story. You, everybody comes upon this away. Most of the people I meet, they just don't drop into talking about fat and inflammation or gluten or whatever they're talking about. They have a personal interest that's passionate, near and dear to them, that allows them to be the greatest advocate for whatever it is. So tell me your story. Well, I, uh, um, it's, it goes way back when we're children, right? It usually does. But um, to make it very quick, I grew up with a mother who was very ill. Most of the memories I have of my mother are of her being ill with uh, different health conditions. And so, uh, in fact, most of the memories I have I, of her are me walking into her dark bedroom, laying there suffering. Yes. And, but my mother's uh, choices, and I always emphasize choice, okay, led her down an unhealthy path. So... You know, she was very overweight. Uh, she smoked over a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. She had a poor diet. And she had enormous stress. You can imagine raising three young children all by yourself with no support. So she had no husband. She had no financial support. She had very little income. She uh, had no family support. So that combined, all of that combined with her health conditions, um, unfortunately, she passed away at the very young age of 36. And oh. she, I know, and she left behind three young children with nowhere to go. And so I always like to emphasize choice when I talk about health, because really, in the end, it's about the choices that we make and the ones that we do affect not just us, but they affect other people as well. So at my mother's memorial service, I almost, I, it was like an aha moment. And I said to myself, she didn't have to die. She could have made different choices. And it was right then that I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to help other people make different choices, better choices, and I wanted them to know that they have choice to make because my mother is not unlike many people who feel like they don't have any choice, that this is their lot in life, this is the hand they've been dealt, and so they just throw their, their arms up in the air and that's the end of it. So how so, old were you when your mother passed away? I was 17 by the time she died and my brother, my youngest brother was eight and the middle brother was 10. So we had um, an age range and unfortunately 
because uh, we didn't have anywhere to go, we were split up and we never got back together again in terms of living as a family. And uh, so it's really important that people really take note of what they're doing with their health. And, you know, it's funny because like, for example, on Twitter, I'll put out there every so often, if you don't take care of your health, who will? Question mark, right? Well, one time this man answered me and he said, my wife. Oh. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's, it's really, that's how I got started in the helping profession. So I started there and wanting to help people make different, better choices in their life. And that took me down the road of nutrition and health. And here I am today. Wow. So you're a fat cell researcher. A fat yeah. cell researcher. What yeah. made you decide fat was what you were going to research? Because there's a lot of ways you can go when you want to help people. Right. Well, you know, my, when I first started out, my focus, and before it was a buzzword, I was uh, very interested in the impact powerful impact that low level inflammation has on the body. Okay. And in fact, I had, I was coined the inflammation terminator way back <laughs> when, because nobody was really, I wanted to educate the public because the core cause of most illness, disease, master aging and weight gain is low level inflammation. And so I wanted to get that message out there and I, and I kept pushing it wherever I had the opportunity to do so. And um, then I realized that most of my clients were overweight. In fact, 99% of them were overweight. You know, I wanted to help people make change and I have a background in psychology. So I was able to, I am still able to combine that knowledge of health and nutrition and uh, uh, behavior change, right? To help people. So and interesting. So, Interesting to hear with you, like you say, your background in psychology is that I started out with that background in psychology too. So I'm very into people's thinking, their thought process surrounding whatever has to do with their illness. And I realized that, and you might have realized this too, before they can do anything to themselves physically, they have to have that mind shift. And it's always curious to me as to what makes some people have that mind shift and other people don't have that mind shift. They, some may never have it. Um, so what is that? That's something that's interesting with the psychology background. But let me just say this. I think the inflammation that happens all over the body impairs your thinking and judgment too. <laughs> it absolutely does. In fact, I was on a show last night and we were talking about this very same thing. We were talking about how uh, there's research out now showing that inflammation actually low level inflammation causes depression and inflammation also causes anger so you can imagine we knew it caused we knew that stress and inflammation were directly intertwined okay but now we know depression is a result of inflammation in the body low level and anger as well so it really behooves a person to really pay attention to that inflammation Information that is setting up in the body and before you really know you have it it's years down the road you know it's cumulative so um you know it's and that is the same for weight gain as well it's cumulative. oh so so explain in terms that the audience can understand now people have heard of inflammation they're throwing it around at cocktail parties mm -hmm. but what do they when they're throwing the words around in cocktail parties, tell them how to explain it to that person next to them who hasn't heard about it yet. What is it? Good question. That's a great question. You have to explain it in a way, in such a way that most people can understand it. So Absolutely. I like to use, uh, there are three different types of inflammation. Okay. There is acute inflammation. And I like to say it's not so cute <laughs> because it gets your attention. It hurts. It's swollen. It's painful. It's like, that terrible sprain, swollen ankle, or that awful sunburn or head cold, right? Mm -hmm. Or that cut on the finger. So when you cut your finger, for example, an enormous amount of inflammatory molecules are released. And soldiers, if you will, rush to the site to repair the wound. The wound heals, the soldiers go away, the inflammation goes away, and all is well. 
And then the next type of inflammation is called silent inflammation or low level inflammation. And it is, as I mentioned earlier, the core cause of most illness, disease, and faster aging. So diseases like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, those types of diseases are the result of low level inflammation in the body. And unlike acute inflammation, uh, silent inflammation emits just a trickle of inflammatory molecules. And most people think that, well, isn't this better? And it's not because the inflammation never goes away. It stays, it's there 24 seven, unbeknownst to the person initially, okay? And in fact, 75% of our population has low level inflammation and they don't even know it. So you can say that silent inflammation is like having a sore on the inside of your body that never heals. It's like a glowing ember that if not doused completely, will erupt into a, uh, a full-blown fire in the form of health conditions later down the road. Okay. And so the third type of inflammation is what I call fat inflammation. It's a silent inflammation of our fat cells. So if you'd like me to go on, I can- Oh yeah, that was, so that, now I'm saying, okay, now let's put the meat on that bone. <laughs> so, so, but before we go to fat inflammation mm -hmm. particularly, Educate us on, we talked about the low level inflammation. You said it's the cause of most chronic diseases and people are like saying, what? Well, I, I just got the heart disease. I just got the blood pressure. I just got the this, that, and the other thing. What do you mean low level inflammation, silent inflammation? What are some of the diseases based on real, now that we have real research that Americans like? Now there's a lot out there that's true that we don't have research on. It's still true, but Americans, we like to have Prove it to okay. me, prove it to me, prove it to me. <laughs> You're a researcher. What can you prove about this low-level inflammation? What diseases do we now know it's associated with? Most all illness and disease, okay? So as I mentioned, heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, the list goes on and on. I mean, very few are not inflammatory related. Uh, you know, it's... It, it's really important that you get to a point where um, you're, you're in the prevention mode as opposed to waiting for it to happen. And as you mentioned, you know, people wondering, whoa, wait a minute, you know, inflammation, I just got heart disease. But, and that's a very good point, but the, the problem is, is that there's been low level inflammation circulating throughout the body for a long time. And that's why I say, if it's not doused completely, it's going to erupt into a full-blown fire. So although you call it silent, mm -hmm. usually what other people may call silent, to those of us who are in the health profession, it's mm -hmm. not silent. There are signs and symptoms that are going on in the quote-unquote silent. So if you're, what do people look for to suspect that they might have this inflammation. This is before we get to the fat inflammation thing. What do people, what might people see? Well, they're tired all the time. They're uh, physically, they're not feeling well. They have uh, a fever or they just don't have any more get up and go. They're, they have uh, dry skin, dry hair. They have mouth ulcers. And anything that is not normal with the body is a sign of inflammation. Now, having said that, there are, we have things that go on with our body that are inflammatory, like arthritis, for example, where it's, con where it's confined to just, say, the knee, for example. We have, however, like, for example, in heart disease, the, we have calcification or uh, inflammation on the arterial wall. It sets up there creating... Um, lesions, if you will, which end up blocking the artery, okay. that is inflammation that has been taking place for a while. So uh, we have different types of inflammation. It doesn't mean that if you have circulating low-level inflammation that it's going to affect every part of your body. It just depends on maybe it's a genetic predisposition to a certain disease or illness that um, will uh, create this uh, disease or illness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so silent is not really silent, silent as... No, there can be symptoms, right. So you can have, for example, in heart disease, you can have uh, pain, chest pain, 
you can have different heart symptoms, but that doesn't always mean that it's inflammation, it could be stress, you know, which in, in, can be inflammatory as well. But, you know, it's really important, and this is a good time to say this, that, it, that we take really good care of our health because it's all, as you know, Dr. Veronica, it's all integrated. Everything is holistic. So when we, you know, take care of our emotional, mental health, we take care of our physical health, and we make sure that everything is uh, addressed, then we're doing what we need to do to create optimal health. Because if we just focus on one area, like a lot of people think that they're just working out and that's all they need to do for their health. Their diet doesn't matter. And uh, it doesn't work like that. Everything is kind of uh, it's integrated. Okay, so now let's get over to the fat flammation. Right. Define so, it for us. Okay, so. Um, you can look, first of all, fat formation is the silent inflammation of our fat cells. And this happens very silently, but we do know we have this, okay, if we're gaining weight. And you can, we have about 100 billion fat cells throughout our body, and they're all about the size of a period on the end of the sentence when healthy, okay? And you can look at these um, fat cells like little factories that are spewing out inflammatory molecules. And this has a metabolic effect that slows down the metabolism, causing weight gain for you. And it becomes a vicious cycle because the more inflammation that's released from the fat cell, the more fat is packed into that cell. And it's not just fat, it's sugar and other compounds that create more of a bloated, expanded fat cell that you see as weight gain. Okay, so... The types of, for example, the types of foods people eat, that, that really healthy fat cell that was about the size of a period on the end of a sentence becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, or it just becomes bigger. And um, this, this is a problem because the very foods people are eating, and a lot of people don't realize that some of the very foods they're eating they think are healthy are creating these larger fat cells, okay. causing weight gain. All right, so, so I, I have a, a few questions about that, but I want to go yeah. on what you just said. These foods that you're eating that you think are healthy are actually causing mm -hmm. this inflammation and causing you to get fatter. Tell people what are those foods that they may think are healthy that aren't so healthy. Right. So that's a very good question. So, uh, for example, a lot of people eat yogurt. Oh, well, I'm doing great. I'm eating yogurt. Well, these yogurts have more sugar, most of them, than a candy bar. Okay? And uh, other foods like whole wheat bread, for example. Two slices of whole wheat bread can raise your blood sugar as much as two tablespoons of sugar. Oh, okay. wow. That's yeah. Amazing. So that's really something to take note of. Um, there are cooking oils that people are using that are very high in the fat omega-6. Which ones? Omega-6 omega and omega-3 are very healthy for you, but we ingest way too much omega-6. It's in uh, packaged processed foods. It's in... Uh, the food manufacturers love it because it's a cheap. It's cheap. Uh, a lot of the foods ingredients they use have omega six in, in them, like corn, for example. Corn is the grain highest in omega six. When you ingest an excess amount of omega six fat, uh, you create a compound called arachidonic acid, and you don't have to remember the name, but it gets stored in the fat cell, and the fat cell gets cranky when arachidonic acid is stored in there. So remember, this is inflammation, it's an, an immune response. And um, it, it, it begins to emit inflammatory molecules, which slows down the metabolism, and it becomes this vicious cycle. And so uh, uh, oils like corn oil, for example, or vegetable oil, or canola oil, for example, people think are healthy, when in fact, canola oil is inflammatory and it's highly processed. If you, if you could see how canola oil is processed, you wouldn't even use it. And so what you want to do is you want to swap out those types of oils for healthy oils like avocado oil or macadamia nut oil or coconut oil. If you're trying to lose weight, those are the oils to go to because 
those oils help shrink belly fat cells. They help shrink fat in particular. And this is another important point that a lot of people believe that when you lose fat, you're losing the fat cells, that you're actually losing the fat cells when in fact, you're just shrinking those cells. You, you keep your number of fat cells unless you become morbidly obese, and then you start to, they start to die off. But um, you, what you wanna do, your goal is to shrink those fat cells. So I, I'm, 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 on my, I'm on my diet, mm -hmm. I'm getting healthy again. You're telling me, okay, eat, eat avocado oil and all these other oils, but I'm gonna go you one better. I'm not gonna eat any fat at all. Is that okay? That's a great question. No, that's the worst thing you can do. <laughs> because when you don't eat any fat, your body, in fact, will begin to create pack on the pounds. Because a lot of times, you're just eating carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, or an excess amount of even healthy carbohydrates, okay? We want fat. Healthy fat burns fat across the board. Omega-3 fat, is as important as omega-6 as I mentioned, but we get too much of that omega-6 and omega-3 then can't do its job of reversing inflammation within the fat cell and throughout the body. So when it's able to do its job, you will then of course shrink that fat cell and it burn fat. So you want to kick all those uh, foods that are high in omega-6 like packaged processed foods, junky foods, you know, uh, you want to get rid of all those cooking oils like vegetable oil, corn oil, canola oil, soy oil. You want to add in healthy oils. And uh, you want to stop eating foods that are fed uh, corn, for example, which are conventionally raised foods. Eat as much uh, pasture-raised poultry that you can, pasture-raised eggs, omega-3 eggs. You want to bring in as much grass-fed meat as you can, beef and lamb. And uh, because these, these uh, because grass-fed beef and lamb are high in omega-3. And the products that come from these animals, like eggs and dairy, that are uh, grass-fed as well. So I'm, I'm also going to get healthy, and I've decided I, I'm giving up red meat. I'm not eating any beef. Was, is there a problem with that? No, not at all. If you do not like to eat meat, you do not have to eat meat. It's okay. But make sure that you get a quality protein in your diet. Protein is crucial for fat loss. Very important. And it has to be quality because what you want to do is you want to trigger those weight loss hormones. So you want to trigger the hormone CCK, for example. That's a natural appetite suppressant. Uh, you, want to, you want to trigger the hormone... Uh, um, uh, this last turn of thought, <laughs> but you want to trigger weight loss hormones, okay? And these will help you satiate. For example, research shows that simply eating two eggs in the morning stops hunger and cravings for hours. And the people who ate the eggs in the morning lost a market amount of weight loss compared to those that did not. Mm. So make sure that. Uh, you definitely get that quality protein in because you want to trigger those hormones. And the, and the hormone I was trying to remember was leptin, okay? I was just saying, leptin and ghrelin, leptin and ghrelin. <laughs> right, so leptin tells your brain you've had enough food that, you know, I'm, hung, I'm not hungry anymore. So it's, it, they, they, it's Greek for uh, thin. So that means when you have enough protein, you're not going to be hungry. And ghrelin is the hormone that actually makes you hungry. It's, I call it the growling hormone because it, it makes your stomach growl when uh, telling you it's time to eat. Ah, yes. So, so you said quality proteins, quality proteins that um, they're going to decrease this inflammation that's going on. Can you rate for us what are the quality proteins? A lot of people, like I said, oh, I'm not, I'm not giving up red meat. I love it. I love grass fed, and you know. So yeah. when you talk about quality proteins, give the definition because I hear people a lot of times say, "But I eat healthy," and then I find out what they're eating, and healthy is not really healthy, but they don't know that. But right. define quality protein. Quality protein means you have all the essential amino acids, okay? And that's very important. It's like uh, it helps 
helps your immune system. It helps, as I mentioned, ensure that you're triggering those weight loss hormones examples that I gave you earlier. And uh, so if you're a vegetarian, you want to make sure that you have a combination of protein, of veg, uh, non-meat sources such as rice and beans, for example, or you, there are protein powders like pea powder that, uh, or pea rice powder uh, that are very effective in helping vegetarians to, to um, get rid of that resistant weight that they have going on. And um, whey protein, for those that aren't vegetarian, uh, studies show is highly more, uh, powerful in terms of busting through weight loss resistance. If you ensure uh, you have adequate protein quality sources, you will definitely make uh, weight, weight gain history in your okay. life. So I'm going to put a little disclaimer here just because I agree with what you're saying, but I want to say something on that about whey protein. Yes, it's fabulous, unless you're one of those people who are sensitive to whey, and there right. are quite a few people who are sensitive to whey. And so this is why um, it's a good idea to have somebody on your team who is aware of what could be your problem. You could say, I went off, I started breaking my protein shakes and nothing's happening. Well, if you're sensitive to whey, that means it's gonna cause inflammation in your body and right. you're gonna gain weight because you're having a food sensitivity, an immune reaction, the inflammation, stress equals weight gain. So although whey is a great source, there are people who are very sensitive to it. And so therefore, and a lot of people, more than you think, are sensitive to it. So you have to, right. you can't, every, all, one size doesn't fit all. Whey is great. I think it's the best, except in the 50% of people that I deal with who are sensitive to whey. <laughs> yeah, and there is um, a form of whey that is 99.9% um, free of the lactose that is causing sensitivity. And, uh, it, and for people who are, it seems to be highly tolerable, which is very good, but there are that, that percentage of people that really can't take any form of dairy whatsoever. So in that case, you want to stay obviously away from whey. But there are other high quality protein sources. And so I recommend that people get about, um, if you're a woman, about the size and thickness of the palm of your hand at every meal. And if you're a man, about the size and thickness of your whole hand at every meal in terms of protein. Wonderful. Now, let's talk about the gut, the gut, the gut. I have a gut feeling that this <laughs> is going to be fat. Say yeah. something about inflammation and the digestive tract, the gut. Very important. This is, I can't underscore the importance of your gut health. We have about 100 trillion gut bacteria, okay? I know it doesn't sound very pleasant, but these gut bacteria are crucial for your optimal health, your mental health, and your weight as well. So 70% of our immune system resides within our gut. 90% of the serotonin made uh, which I call the happy transmitter because serotonin makes you feel happy. Yes. It's made not in the brain, but it's made in the gut. In fact, we have 500 million billion, sorry, brain cells in the lining of our gut, all right? Our gut is often called our second brain. And specific strains of bacteria are directly related to directly or causal of your weight loss or weight gain, all right? So you can see how crucial it is that we take very good care of our gut health. And more and more research is pouring in about the importance of our gut health. And I talk about it in my book. Um, and so what we wanna do is make sure that we create uh, a, an abundance of healthy gut bacteria. Right now, the majority of people in our nation have an abundance of unhealthy gut bacteria. So unhealthy gut bacteria love sugar and junk food, okay? Literally, they need sugar to thrive and survive. And so there are 10 times more gut bacteria than there are human cells in our body. So you can imagine the types of cravings you're gonna have, okay? So these gut bacteria extract more calories from those types of foods and store them as fat. And so it's really important that we kick all of those junk foods to the curb 
all right? All that sugar and uh, all the things we know aren't very healthy. Uh, and add in foods that are gonna create better gut health. And so that means that we wanna add in foods that are prebiotic and probiotic. And prebiotic foods are simply what I call fertilizer for healthy gut bacteria. They feed the good gut bacteria, the good microbiota. And these foods are like asparagus and onions and garlic, bananas and beans. These types of foods are food, are a food source, which means you're creating an abundance of them. And then, and then you want to add in probiotics. And probiotics actually plant healthy bacteria in the gut. And so these are cultured and fermented foods like yogurt, for example without sugar because remember sugar feeds the bad gut bacteria so we want people to stop eating those fruity yogurts well I'm not eating them with the sugar in them anyway I'm using the ones with the artificial sweetener yeah that's another topic right <laughs> and, uh, and so we want to make sure that um, we add in foods that are culture and fermented like yogurt no sugar and then we want to add in uh, pickles and sauerkraut and olives and other types of you know, you know, different cheeses, in fact, all of these types of foods plant healthy bacteria in the gut, creating an abundance. And that means you're going to have uh, better health, you're going to have better mental health, and you're also going to lose weight. And lastly, I'd like to say that I highly recommend people add in a probiotic supplement every day because you're actually planting that really in abundance of really healthy gut bacteria. Make sure it's a quality product, though. Because um, if it's not guaranteed, it means that some of the bacteria will die and you're not getting the amount that they, that they are stating is on the bottle. A quality product, the manufacturers, uh, it's what they call overages. They use overages. They add in more of the bacteria than they state because they know there's going to be a natural die-off. And so um, make sure it's guaranteed. So is it enough just to take a probiotic, just to take the probiotic pill? Uh, not really, because you always want to uh, you know, cover your bases. You always want to make sure you're getting really quality food in your diet. You want to make sure you're getting uh, a variety of food in your diet. So these foods um, also add in different benefits as well. You're, you're getting fiber and you're getting um, you know, the antioxidants, phytochemicals from these different types of foods as well. So. Very So, Lori Shemek, thank you for being on Dr. Veronica's Wellness Revolution. Oh, it was my fat pleasure. Thank you. Fat inflammation. Say that for me. Fat inflammation, like fat and inflammation. Fat. How to fight fat inflammation is the name of my book. Yeah, and you can find it anywhere books are sold. The name of the game is Inflammation and the Digestive Tract. You heard it here, Dr. Lori Shamick, expert on all of this, because she had a mother who left her orphaned at 17 years old, and so now has made their career. I thank you. You're you making you know, those ashes into roses. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's been fun. Hey everyone, I want to really thank you so much for listening to my new podcast, Dr. Veronica's Wellness Revolution. I really enjoy helping others regain their health. So if this episode helps you, it can definitely help others. Do me a favor, give us a five-star review on iTunes to help me spread this message. And because I really appreciate your help so much, I will be giving away a $25 Amazon gift card each week to a random individual. Check the show notes of this episode for the details on how to win. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Wellness Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more on how to bring wellness into your life, visit drveronica.com. See you all next week. Take care.